One of the most frightening parasites we have to endure is the tick. Unlike lice, which you can feel and see, and unlike mosquitoes, which you can hear and swat, ticks specialize in making themselves as unnoticeable as possible. There are many hundreds of species of these little buggers which all specialize in different hosts. Imagine, if you will, that we took a trip back through the evolutionary tree of the tick. How far back does it go? What animals did they suck the blood of? Are modern ticks that much different? Ticks have been one of the many scourges of humankind since the very beginning of the written word. Of course, they were bugging the hell out of our species and our relatives for millions of years before that, but that's beside the point. The little hacksaw carrying arachnids and the diseases they bring with them have been recognized since ancient times. Earliest references to these critters date back to the ancient Egyptians with a papyrus scroll referencing a fever brought on by the little hitchhiker. There are references dating back to ancient Greece among Homer's works, including a brief cameo by dog ticks. Ticks have long been associated with disease, but it wasn't until the late 19th century that the magnitude of the situation was understood. The discovery of the origin of the Texas fever pathogen in livestock tick bites was what really hit it home. They presently rank in as the second largest vector of human diseases in the world, only playing second fiddle to the humble mosquito. Despite its silver medal, it does hold the gold for most important disease vector in North America. You may be familiar with the tick. You in what army, Pinko? Uh, uh, knock it off. Shoot, not that tick. Ah, uh, right one. But I can guarantee there's plenty for us to learn about these awesome, yet extremely awful blood beasts. Meet the ticks. Ticks are what is known as obligate hematophagous ectoparasites. Obligate means they are restricted to their mode of life. Their mode of life, the hematophagous part, is that of a bloodsucker. They subsist entirely on blood from other animals. They're considered ectoparasites because they latch onto their hosts from the outside. This is one of two modes of life a parasite can have. The other is endoparasitism. This is when the parasite enters and lives in the host's body, like the fungus that kills cellar spiders, and the worms which control snails. As it stands, ticks belong to the order Ixodida. This group contains about 900 species of ticks differing mostly in color, hardness, and host preference. Ixodida is split into three living families, Argacidae, the soft ticks, Ixodidae, the hard ticks, and Nutalielidae. Hard ticks are the ones you are probably most familiar with. They have a distinctive shell-like exoskeleton shield covering their backside. See this little circular hat-like thing here? That's the shield. It's called a scutum. This structure is used for protection and is one of the main characteristics used to tell the difference between hard and soft ticks. Male hard ticks have a much larger scutum, which covers most of their backs, while females have a smaller one, so their bodies can stretch to hold more blood. The other characteristic which sets the hard ticks apart is the mouth parts. See the little bits poking out of the front here? That's not their head, it's their mouth parts. Since ticks conduct the delicate procedure of stealing your blood, they need to do it in the most painless and least noticeable way possible. The mouth parts are collectively termed the capitulum. The capitulum is composed of five parts. These bulbous dingleberries are called the palps. The palps are used to help locate nearby hosts and protect the even nastier bits. These two hooked fang-like things are called the chelicerae. Chelicerae are the structures used to apprehend food. They are a main characteristic of the group Chelicerata, containing arachnids, horseshoe crabs, the extinct eurypterids, sea spiders, and arctic friends. They usually take the form of hollow fangs or pincers. For the ticks, they're like jagged scissors used for slicing through their host's flesh. The third mouth part is this centerpiece right here, the hypostome. The hypostome, as its barbed and dangerous appearance would suggest, is the main tool the tick uses to suck down blood. The teeth to either side of the hypostome point backwards like a fishhook to make it harder to take out of the host. 
The next group, the soft ticks, or Argacidae, are different from the hard ticks in a few key ways. They're called soft ticks because they lack the hard scutum shield of the Ixidid ticks. In its place is a soft leathery disc covering their backsides. Another major difference is the placement of the mouthparts. While the hard ticks have their mouthparts sticking out the front, soft ticks have theirs placed directly underneath their bodies. This makes it difficult to impossible to see their mouthparts unless you turn them upside down. Their lack of armor can indicate their preferred host type. The armor of the hard ticks allows them to attach to just about any group of animals, while the soft ticks are relegated to birds, reptiles, and other animals without a lot of integument to get in the way. The third group, the Nutaliellidae, contains one genus and one species, Nutaliella namaqua. This species is different from the other groups by containing a mixture of features. They have soft bodies, but a small scutum-like shield near their heads. They lack setae, the hair-like structures used by some ticks, but mostly other arachnids and insects, to sense the world around them. They are endemic to southern Africa and feed on a variety of reptiles and birds, and a few mammals. Many researchers have found the Nutalia to contain the most primitive characteristics of all living ticks. This likely points to it representing a similar form to the common ancestor to all living ticks. The generalist nature of the Nutaliella in its host preferences and anatomy provides further proof of this common ancestor hypothesis, as organisms tend to start out generalists and evolve into specialists over time. Before jumping into the evolution of ticks, let's do a run-through of exactly how they feed. Tick Biology your typical tick begins its life as one of hundreds of eggs laid by an adult tick. These eggs, which look suspiciously like the fish eggs used in sushi, are extremely sticky. Mama Tick, who promptly dropped dead after laying down her spawn, made sure to place her eggs in clumps on low-lying foliage. This is so they are in a perfect spot to be unknowingly picked up by a host species. Once these skittering critters hatch from their globular eggs, they search for their first meal. This first stage in the tick lifestyle, a ticklet if you will, is transparent, sexless, and clumsily clambers about atop three pairs of legs, kind of like your weird cousin. They grow their fourth set of legs once they've had their first blood banquet. Some hard tick species spend their entire lives on the same host. Other species are two or three host ticks, and drop off their hosts to molt and find another. The newly hatched ticklet, the eight-legged nymph stage that follows, and mature adult ticks exhibit a behavior known as questing. A questing tick will clamber up to the highest point in its environment to give it the best shot of hitching a ride on a host. It reaches out its frontmost pairs of legs, and kind of just wiggles them around, sensing for the presence of a host. Once a host brushes past, the tick latches on. These living burrs then wander around the skin of their host for a bit, trying to find the perfect place to hunker down for dinner. One of the best tools for host locating at the tick's disposal are the holler's organs. Holler's organs are microscopically small pores in the frontmost pair of legs. The pores hold a forest of even smaller setae. These hairs act together with the pore they rest in to smell the heat, humidity, air disturbance, and carbon dioxide emissions of a host. If these feet noses don't work, the tick can always just use its big ol' eyes. A tick is not divided into different body parts, like an insect's head, thorax, and abdomen, or like other arachnids' cephalothorax and abdomen. They're just a big head. See these rounded spots on the side? Those are the eyes. The mouth parts sticking out the front are just the mouth, not its head. What's even wackier is that these eyes allow the outwardly simple tick to see color, light, and motion. Even though they don't look like they're registering everything in their environment, ticks can totally just straight up see you, staring longingly at your supple, blood-filled dermis. <sighs> Evolution of ticks. The origin of ticks is a controversial subject of much debate. This is mostly because they leave little to no fossils. A teeny arthropod made of chitin, hemolymph, and agony doesn't exactly have what it takes to become fossilized, except under extremely pristine conditions. Fossilization is a rare event, 
It allows the preservation of evidence of past life. There are many different methods by which an organism might become fossilized. When it comes to vertebrates, their hydroxyapatite skeletons simply get replaced by minerals, which dissolved into groundwater. This is the main way by which they end up fossilized, but not the only way. Invertebrates with their lack of hard bony structures have a much harder time of becoming etched into the fossil record. Some, like mollusks, have calcite-based shells to protect themselves. These are easy to fossilize and sometimes remain completely unchanged within a rock. Arthropods have a harder time of it. You can more easily get fossils of marine animals, like trilobites, replaced by another mineral. But land arthropods are even harder to fossilize. The best resolution for arthropods is via amber fossilization. Amber starts out as a sticky resin, which oozes from coniferous trees when they're wounded. It easily captures small critters and encapsulates them in a quickly hardening natural polymer. As it hardens and falls away from the tree, it must become covered in sediments, like your average fossil, to escape decay. Despite their minute presence in the fossil record, there's still a presence. There are now over a dozen specimens of fossil amber, which preserve the bodies of ticks in 3D exactly where they fell. There's also a preserved tick from the auditory canal of a woolly rhinoceros ice mummy. A report of a tick preserved in non-amber fossil deposits dating to the Eocene exists as well, but is unsubstantiated by a physical fossil. The vast majority of fossil ticks are recorded from Dominican and Baltic amber. Since amber from these regions have been known to science the longest, they've seen the most research. That being said, amber from Myanmar has quickly become the top research item of interest for paleoentomologists. On top of the many invertebrates preserved in Myanmar amber, there's many fragments and whole bodies of vertebrates found including non-avian dinosaur feathers, avian dinosaur babies, geckos, baby snakes, and frogs. Based on these amber fossils, which date from the Eocene Epoch for Baltic and Oligocene Epoch for Dominican, the fossil record of ticks can be pushed back 44 million years. Once we include specimens from Myanmar amber, which date back 99 million years, the evolution of ticks can be pushed even further back into the start of the late Cretaceous period. Amber from Myanmar has come under fire from many academics over the last few years. This is due to the political conflicts going on in the region from which the amber is sourced. Civil war has made the country of Myanmar rather difficult to survey for and collect amber. On top of that, a surging amber industry and no child labor laws allows many wage slaves, many of which are children or teens, to work themselves to death. That makes the buying, selling, trading, and study of new Myanmar amber unethical and unworthy of consideration. If you'd like to learn more about the issue, check out my video on Oculodentavis here. Due to the overall lack of ancient tick remains, many hypotheses have been proposed as to when they first appeared and who they fed on. The most accepted hypothesis is based on tick-to-host association. The driving force for long-term evolution of ticks is based on the co-evolution of tick species and their hosts. This assumes that ticks are a very ancient group and have developed over time to better suit the different hides of animals which have appeared and disappeared across the face of the globe for millions of years. Researchers in the 1980s hypothesized that ticks first appeared in the late Paleozoic era and first began to parasitize soft-skinned amphibians before moving on to harder-skinned reptiles and synapsids. This view held for many decades until it was dispelled in the late 1990s and early 2000s. Exactly how these arachnids transitioned into parasitism has also been in question. The 1990s and 2000s upheaval of tick evolutionary theory changed from the hypothesis that ticks first started out as nest predators of reptiles, to the hypothesis that ticks started out as roving scavengers. This would mean they diverged from a shared ancestor with mites to become enormous scavengers of biological material and dead things. Over time, they would have found live biological material to be more beneficial and diverged to take advantage of that material on a living host. This scavenger hypothesis has true ticks appearing in the Cretaceous period. Without any fossils dating back to before the Cretaceous period, 
and without genetics able to give definitive answers as to how old the lineage is, it becomes too speculative to provide any solid facts. That being said, it would make sense that the lineage is a bit older than the Cretaceous aged fossils that have been found. Speaking of which, let's take a look at a recent specimen which tells us who they were parasitizing. Dinosaur Ticks Dr. David Grimaldi, American Museum of Natural History entomologist, was looking through some amber specimens the museum had. Dr. Grimaldi and colleagues realized the specimens contained both several bodies of ticks and dinosaur feathers. The amber comes from Myanmar, meaning it dates to around 99 million years ago. Five ticks were preserved in the orangey substance. They included a nymph or ticklet, if you will, an engorged adult tick, and two adults covered in beetle hair. The beetles which left those hairs are still around today, and it's known their larvae feed off discarded bits of skin and feathers. The adults are covered in protective hairs which slough right off as a defense, which creates mats of hairs in nests of modern dinosaurs. These nasty hairs stick to anything which visits the nest. The presence of these hairs proves the ticks were infesting a dinosaurian nest. The feathers in the amber were found to be too primitive to belong to avian dinosaurs, which were alive at the time the amber encased the ticks. This means the feathers were non-avian dinosaur in origin. This then proves the ticks were infesting the nests of non-avian dinosaurs, and the ticks at this time were dinosaur parasites. This find indicates two important things. First, it provides new evidence that dinosaurs raised their young in nests. Second, it suggests Cretaceous-aged dinosaurs had to deal with parasites like ticks. The first thing about nests already had a lot of evidence to back it up, but more is always welcome, as it helps to reinforce what was already considered fact. These specimens are the first concrete evidence of ancient host-parasite relationships between ticks and dinosaurs. It was always hypothesized or speculated that ticks were around in the Cretaceous, and that they must have sucked dino blood, but it never had any evidence. This specimen is essentially the smoking gun, the killer, and the victim together at the crime scene. One of the ticks, which was entangled in the dinosaur feather, belongs to an already known species, Cornipalpatum burmanicum. This tick belongs to the still living Ixodidae family, making it a hard tick. Its features are very similar to the black leg ticks which cause Lyme disease today. Two of the preserved ticks, one engorged with blood and one not, are a completely new species, unlike those alive today. They were named Dinocroton draculi, meaning Dracula's terrible tick, for obvious reasons. They aren't at all like the hard ticks of the Exodidae. They have a soft porous covering on their backs like the soft ticks, mouth parts which protrude from the front of their bodies like hard ticks, and no scutum shield over their backs at all. This makes them more similar to the Neutalielid ticks, which are still alive, but are different enough to warrant their own new family, the Dinocrotonidae. The fully engorged tick shows an eightfold increase in body volume. This means this species fed quite quickly. Makes sense if you're parasitizing dinosaur hatchlings. Unfortunately, it's impossible to analyze the blood inside the tick as it was only partially immersed in the tree resin before fossilization completely replaced the body contents with minerals. Ancient ticks were just as likely to spread diseases among the dinosaurs as they are today with us. Dinosaurs, especially the young or more bird-like species, would have been easy targets. There are many species of ticks alive today which invade the nests of birds and mammals to make an easy meal out of soft-skinned hairless or near-hairless young. The Lost Fossil Tick of the Green River The first fossil of a tick, or tick-like arachnid, was described in 1885 by paleontologist and entomologist Samuel Scudder. His report includes illustrations of what is described as a fossil from the Eocene-aged Green River Formation in Wyoming. It was given the name Ixodes tertiarius, and was briefly described in the initial report. According to a paper written by Dr. Jason Dunlop of the Museum für Naturkunde, the fossil is lost. 
Images or mention of the fossil's location could not be found, and the only thing left of its existence is a poorly defined illustration. This original illustration excludes many of the characteristics which would help identify it as part of the modern tick genus, which Sam Scudder had done in his report 135 years ago. Dr. Jason Dunlop went to some lengths to find the specimen by contacting a line of different people attached to Scudder's work. This started with the A.S. Picard collection, which Sam Scudder had mentioned his tick fossil belonged to. Dr. Alpheus Picard was a professor at Brown University in the late 1800s in the fields of paleontology, entomology, zoology, and geology. Dr. Jason Dunlop's inquiries to the university turned up zero ticks. Reportedly, the specimen may have made its way to Harvard University. A journey to this institution uncovered an empty box in their collections which read, Ixodes Tertiarius Scudder, Zetel Handbook, 1885, Figure 906. Connected to this label is an entry in the Harvard Fossil Database, but no fossil. A few more trials and errors led from Harvard back to Brown. Turns out, many of the specimens in Dr. Alpheus Picard's collection were used as teaching material at Brown University for countless decades, many of which were important holotype specimens of incredibly rare insect fossils. Once this was realized, many were taken out of the classroom and saved for study, but the tick was not among them. First Fossil Ticks Many specimens of woolly rhinoceros ice mummies have been found since 1776. One of them preserved a tick which had been sucking its blood at the time of death. This tick came from the auditory canal, the passageway between outer and middle ear. The process of mummification makes this specimen probably of the still-living species Dermacentor reticulatus, the best preserved prehistoric tick known. A specimen of Eocene-aged amber from the Baltic region of Europe contains a single unfed adult female tick. It represents the oldest member of the hard tick group Ixodidae. This 44 to 49 million year old tick shares enough characteristics with modern hard ticks that the descriptors and re-describers have confidently placed it in the still living genus Ixodes and subgenus Partipulpiger. It's given the species name Sacinius and is different from the single living species Ixodes partipulpiger ovatus by three teeth per side of her hypostome drinking straw and an extra long spur on one of the leg joints. The original description of this specimen was fine as is, but that was done in 1964. A redescription of the specimen was completed in 2016 with the help of computed tomography scans. Parts of the anatomy which were once shrouded behind amber articles is now plainly visible in excruciating detail, down to every nasty pore, wrinkle, setae, and spine of the blood bag. A study published in 1986 reported the first occurrence of a fossil hard tick from the New World. This tick was preserved in Dominican amber from the Dominican Republic. This amber dates to the Eocene and Oligocene epochs. 30 to 40 million years ago. Thus, this type of amber usually preserves small creepy crawlies relatively similar to the creepy crawlies we still see today. This specimen is an unfed male with enough preserved characteristics to label it in the modern Amblyoma genus. It ambled about when ground sloths were some of the largest land animals in the Caribbean. It's entirely possible these types of ticks parasitize the small ground sloths of the Dominican Republic like Megaloctus and Neoctus, but without close association between them, it's speculation. Prehistoric Monkey Business Another tick specimen important to our discussion of their evolution was described in 2017. This specimen consists of an engorged baby tick, a ticklet if you will, belonging to the hard tick group Ixodidae. Based on the morphology of the specimen, it belongs to the Amblyoma genus. What makes this specimen important is what's preserved inside and right next to it. Preserved in its guts and on the outside of its body were the blood cells of a mammal. The preservation of the specimen was so fine that disease-carrying parasites were detected within the blood cells. These parasites, belonging to the Pyroplasmida order, aren't bacteria and aren't viruses 
but belong to the same eukaryota domain as us. The pyroplasmida contain the Babesiidae and Thaluriidae families of parasites, which can be found commonly in ticks. They are the parasites which ticks unintentionally release upon their hosts. The Babesia parasites cause the disease Babesiosis in livestock and humans, which makes itself known with malaria-like symptoms. More than half of all cases are asymptomatic but those that aren't suffer from headaches, muscle pain, nausea, anorexia, vomiting, sore throat, and more. Whoever this tick was biting before it died was either suffering from this disease or eventually did. Exactly who the tick bit before its death is unknown, but the authors think it may have been a primate. Since the pyroplasmid parasites in the blood are well-known parasites of mammals, the host had to at least be a mammal. Blood cells differ in their size from group to group. Ungulates, bats, and rodents have blood cells ranging in diameter from 2.7 to 6.6 .6 micrometers. Lagomorphs, canines, and primates have blood cell diameters which range from 6.6 .6 to 7.3 micrometers. The blood cells preserved in the amber were measured at around 6.9 to 7.3 micrometers, making their owner either a rabbit, a dog, or a monkey. The fossil record of the island of Hispaniola, a little more than half of which is the Dominican Republic, does not preserve the remains of rabbits or dogs. The series of unfortunate events required to get a canine or lagomorph draining tick into amber is too complicated to easily occur. That means the answer of who got bit by the tick is probably a monkey. Blood was preserved outside the tick's body due to two perforations in the arachnid's body wall. These holes were likely caused by whoever took the tick off. The authors of the study suggest it was groomed off of one primate by another and dunked into the amber. That scenario best fits with the available evidence, but still remains a bit speculative as there's no way to truly corroborate it. These awful little gremlins are equal parts amazing and gruesome. We've seen them diverge from mites which eat our dead cells and the chiggers which cause intense skin irritation. Many are decorated in beautiful, mask-like patterns and colors, while some desperately try to remain hidden with muted browns and grays. The ticks which parasitize Komodo dragons, for instance, look almost exactly like one of their scales to go unnoticed while they drink their fill. As macabre as this journey has been, I think it has been fruitful. We now know ticks have been on this planet since before we existed to be scared of them, the mammoths dealt with them, the saber-tooths, ground sloths, and moas dealt with them. Tyrannosaurs, brontosaurs, raptors, and stegosaurs dealt with them. Even our pre-mammal ancestors may have dealt with them, alongside the giant, salt-resistant, desiccation-resistant amphibians of the Permian. Maybe that'll make you less anxious about them, knowing you aren't the only one who has had to avoid the little buggers. Or maybe it provides you some level of empathy with life of the past, for they went through just as many trials and tribulations as we have, be that the mundane or life-changing. What parasites might we find to get underneath our skin and to make our scalps crawl next? Perhaps a giant parasite which parasitized the thick hides of dinosaurs and pterosaurs. Stay tuned. Make sure you like this video and share it around. Leave a comment if you like and subscribe. Hit the bell icon too if you want to stay in the know with everything Edge. Thanks for watching. Pledge to my Patreon at any tier you like for a slew of many delicious offerings. Special thanks to patrons Dinosaur, Natty Cat, Ed Peretz, Steve Bradshaw, Thea Svensson, Dana Manchester, Aphid Kirby, Chris Frampton, and Antron.